a dance therapist for 32 years, and I've had lots of experience explaining dance therapy to people. But there was a time back in 1989 when I had trouble explaining my dance therapy skills. And that experience stayed with me, and it eventually led me down a road of researching psychodiagnostic assessment in neurology. What happened was the facility where I worked got a call from a woman who needed an evaluation of a 12-year-old child. And I was free, so she brought him in, and as I was ushering him into my office, I saw his head move. It wasn't a big movement. In fact, it was very tiny, very subtle and small. It was almost as if his head had moved in several directions at the same time. I can't imitate this movement. That's because it's an abnormal involuntary movement and it was caused by problems with the extrapyramidal motor system. I'm gonna talk some more about that in a moment, but I wanted to say that it was my training as a dance movement therapist in being able to look very closely at movement and my idea that this particular movement meant that this child was quite ill. In fact, I thought it meant that he was suffering a psychotic break um, that caused me to really be concerned and decide that he needed treatment. I did spend about an hour with this child. I was talking with him. I was trying to, to get a little sense of what he was experiencing. But, you know, he wasn't really very talkative. So in the end, it turned out that it was just those first seconds with him that caused me to refer him to a child psychiatry inpatient unit. When he arrived at that unit, they called me as the referring clinician, and they said to me, how did you know? How could you tell how ill this child is? And I sort of stuttered because I could not bring myself to say I saw it in his head movement, even though that was the truth. But you know, as a matter of fact, there's a very long history of abnormal movement associated with severe forms of psychopathology like schizophrenia. And by the turn of the 19th century, psychiatrists and neurologists had made very, very detailed descriptions of abnormal movement of people with severe psychiatric illnesses. The problem was they disagreed about what was causing these movements. The neurologist, Carl Kalbaum, thought that it, the movements were caused by brain disease. The psychiatrists thought that the movements were caused by psychological problems. This conflict of paradigms took 50 years to resolve. What finally resolved it was that in the 1950s, medications were developed to treat the symptoms of very severe psychiatric illness, and these medications were found to produce these same movements in patients. And so that is what established in the end, finally, that they were neurologic in origin. You would think that maybe ab using abnormal movements to help with diagnosis would have taken off then, but it didn't. <laughs> Um, in fact, what happened then was much more effort went into developing medications to help with the, the really debilitating and troubling symptoms of mental illnesses. And the system for diagnosis continued to be based on psychological symptoms. Well, in medicine, just as an example, there's a test that can determine if I have a strep infection or if I just have a really, really bad cold. But in psychiatry, there are no tests that can definitively, definitively determine exactly what diagnosis someone has. And that's because the system is still based on psychological symptoms, and those symptoms are nonspecific. Okay. A great thing, I think, 
happened this past year. Dr. Thomas Insel of the National Institutes of Mental Health, he's the director, he introduced something new, the research domain criteria. This is a new nosology for psychiatric disorder that will consist of doing and gathering much more research on biological indicators that can then be combined with the psychological symptoms so that we get a much more specific diagnostic system for psychiatry. This is an exciting idea to me because it says maybe, maybe now is the time to really look at the potential of abnormal involuntary movements for psychodiagnosis. Abnormal involuntary movements is the technical term for what I've been talking about. Abnormal involuntary movements are not something we can control and they have no cultural component to them. They are pure indicators of neurochemical and neuroanatomical dysfunction. The central nervous system is very complex and very pervasive, but most of it is devoted to controlling movement. Controlling movement in space, the body in space, and body parts in relation to each other. Of all the parts of the brain that control movement, only one of them the extrapyramidal motor system does not respond to damage or disease with paralysis. Instead, when the extrapyramidal motor system has a disturbance, what happens is that we see disturbance in the smoothness of voluntary movement. So we see disturbances in gait, we see disturbances um, in sometimes the amount, sometimes there's a lack of voluntary movement that takes place. So the extrapyramidal system in health coordinates the smooth execution of movement. I'll give you a demonstration in a moment, but I wanted first to say that the extrapyramidal motor system is made up mostly of the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. It's a functional rather than an anatomical unit, so it's made up of nuclei and fibers. There's no beautiful picture of it to show you, unfortunately. <laughs> but the way that the extrapyramidal system works is th like this. If I tr close my eyes and I try to touch my fingertip to my nose, the basal ganglia helps me initiate that movement, but it's a cerebellum that guides this on the button landing right here on my nose. Parkinson's disease is caused by a disruption in the extrapyramidal system. It's caused specifically by the lack of a neurotransmitter that's essential to movement. However, with Parkinson's disease, the movement, the abnormal movements that we see are of a much more severe quality and they're much more debilitating than the abnormal movements that we associate with psychiatric illness. Dance movement therapists are very skilled in looking at movement. And we use a system created by Rudolf Laban that describes the visible dynamics of movement. And this represents a much finer level of movement description than neurologists use. Going back to the child, if I was going to describe his head movement, in Laban terms, I would say spatially diffuse and unclear with erratic effort flow fluctuations. There's some preliminary research using this finer level of movement description that has shown that there are different patterns of abnormal movements that have been associated with different diagnostic groups. In fact, there's some research that shows that abnormal movements have been detected in a diagnostic group that never historically was associated with abnormal involuntary movements. Of course, lots more research is needed to get clear and reliable patterns and for this information to be useful. But like Dr. Insel of the National Institutes of Mental Health, I think now is the time to start really looking at biological indicators just like movement 
and how that can help psychodiagnosis. And dance movement therapists have systematic, refined observation skills to bring to this process.